I'm the uh, uh, director of the Institute for Government, and welcome to um, this uh, launch of our report, um, a game of two halves. Um, I'll explain a little more about that, and so will the author, who I'll introduce in a minute. What we're going to have in the format of this is uh, Akash Pan, who's the uh, principal author of the report, um, um, will introduce the main themes. You've all got executive summaries um, on your, your places. Then we'll hear from the panel, um, starting with David Laws, who, of course, is, is, as everyone knows, was very closely involved um, in the original programme for government and the negotiation of the coalition, followed by one of the most uh, interesting... Uh, I can't call you a new Tory MP now, Marco. Um, of, of the 2010 intake of, 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 of Tory MPs, Marco James, followed by Jack McConnell, um, former First Minister from Scotland, um, um, to provide a, a broader perspective on what happens with uh, uh, governments in midterm, and particularly coalitions, one of the key features I believe the Institute is to learn from what's happening um, in Edinburgh, Cardiff, and uh, and, and, uh, and elsewhere, um, because there's a remarkable lack of uh, willingness I find in Westminster and Whitehall to learn from the experiences um, in in um, uh, elsewhere in the UK and also from abroad. And finally. Um, uh, Alex Allen, um, who is here in his capacity as having been very closely involved in the preparations of the transition ahead of the last election, and particularly in the contingency planning. And he was involved in the, uh, the uh, famous um, scenario playing um, um, for the outcomes of the election. And, what, what, and Alex is going to talk about the, the, that aspect of preparation by the civil service and whether they can, in fact, prepare for the unexpected and the unseen. Now, um, Akash, um, the principal author, is um, I'm very glad to see him here. I wasn't always sure he would be here um, because he's just started paternity leave. Um, some people call it the European Cup. Akash calls it the uh, paternity leave. He's actually combined <laughs> the two. I got an email as, as, the, as the staff of the IFG did last night saying um, his wonderful new son. Um, 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 we're, we're starting an intern recruitment, so you'll be at the top of the list. Um, um, wonderful you said that he was watching the football last night. Now, whether this is good parenting, I leave for, for others. But anyway, Akash um, is the principal author, and he's been very much involved in a lot of our work uh, on the coalition and the political side of our work. Um, he produced a very good report, very influential report, two years ago, United We Stand on Special Advisors and the Lib Dems, which... Um, after a certain gap was taken up, I'm glad to say, by, by, by Whitehall. You don't win them immediately, but we do win them. Um, and on this occasion, um, the idea was to have a study of what happens to governments in midterm, and particularly, obviously, with the coalition, because there are very different problems with the coalition. But, but there are a lot of examples, which is, again, why Jack's here, of what happens with um, governments overseas. And the report has some fascinating examples of what's happened um, in uh, countries overseas with coalitions about how they try to renew themselves in midterm. Akash. Yeah, thanks very much, Peter, for that. Um, and uh, thanks, of course, to all the panel and everyone else for attending. I'm, I'm going to be very brief, uh, partly because the purpose of this event is to stimulate the debate and uh, to hear the, the, the views of the, of the panelists and everyone else here. Um, I'll be brief also partly because as Peter uh, implied, I've spent, I've spent most of the week in hospital or changing nappies and so on, so I haven't really had time to, to prepare a proper speech, unfortunately. Um, the report, um, just, to, just to give a kind of overview, you've got the summaries on your chair, so I hope you'll, you'll have a chance to look at those. But um, we see it sort of as a, a midlife health check for the, for the coalition, is, is one way I was, I was thinking about it. Uh, we've got a sort of a diagnosis of, of the, of the midterm challenges the coalition faces. Um, we've got a bit of a prognosis looking forward up till 2015, how the situation's likely to develop, what challenges are likely to arise based on the, the, the sort of natural cycle of, of coalition governments that you, you perceive in, in other countries around the world. Um, and then we've got, a, we've got something of our prescription or some suggestions for possible remedies for the, uh, for the ailments that the coalition arguably is, 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 is um, suffering from. Um, I'm not going to run through all the proposals, but um, we set out the case for a, uh, a midterm policy review, um, reprioritization of, of, of key objectives holding the, the government together. Um, while also having increasingly to um, take account of the growing pressures for uh, 
differentiation, emphasis on different difference between the parties up till 2015. Um, we've called the report a game of two halves um, for a couple of reasons. Well, one just being nice to have a, a football metaphor in, during the European Championships, but um, also, uh, first of all, of course, reference to coalition being made up of, of two parties. Now, that sounds like an obvious, trite statement, but actually, when we were doing the report, I was quite struck by how often speaking to people in and around government, you hear the comment or something very similar that all governments are coalitions and therefore the implication being there's nothing particularly novel or challenging about making a formal coalition function. Um, or you hear the line, well, look at Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, you know, that was, that was just as divided and, and, and polarised, if not more so. Uh, than the current government. And I think that's quite interesting because there's an obvious truth in that, that all, all governments, all parties have competing wings and factions and individuals that have to be reconciled within mm -hmm. government. But um, that perspective misses the, the wider party dynamics which we've tried to capture in this report and the way that over time um, the pressures from like, benches and party members increase the, the strains holding the, uh, on, on, on the coalition and the, the, on the relationship between the leadership. Um, it's also a game of two halves, therefore, in the sense of the time, uh, the, 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 uh, in the chronological sense, that is. Um, the first half of the coalition, generally relatively well-functioning, quite a high degree of unity between the parties. International experience does suggest that as you come closer to the next election, for obvious reasons, focus shifts to the competition between the parties for votes, for seats. There's more of a, a zero-sum mentality likely to, likely to take over, or at least there's a risk of that. Um, and therefore, we've, um, we've tried to find some examples from countries including Scotland, uh, Germany, Sweden, and elsewhere for how you can um, avoid that risk and avoid the second half of, of the coalition becoming relatively unproductive and possibly dysfunctional. So um, that's all I will say about the, the, the detail of the report. Um, as I say, thanks very much for, for coming, and uh, I very much look forward to the comments of all the panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Uh, I, mean, I think one of the striking things I feel about the recommendations is that the, 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 sense, the novelty of coalitions of Britain, at one point Akash brings out very clearly, is that and everyone patted themselves on the back and David was one of the leaders of it um, for producing an agreement so quickly, that there have been one or two consequences of that. Um, what wasn't anticipated, the priority of, of, course, of the spending review and spending cuts, of uh, taking it over. Um, what's happened on health and so on. And in fact, there are good reasons why it take, it took, it's taken longer in other countries, why it took Jack longer when he, he, he was doing it in 2003 and so on. There are good reasons for that. And also it leads on to what happens in the second half of Parliament. There's a need for um, rate, having a greater sense of priority between various uh, policies and also relating to economic circumstance, what you'd like to do um, and what, you, what, what you're certain to do and what you'd like to do. And the need to grade promises in that way, and also have an annual stock take. Um, and I think that's something where we're all learning as we go along, and I think one of the values of the report is this sense of a continuous learning process, because certainly for the London-based political class, if not that in Scotland and elsewhere, it's a novel experience. David. Peter, thank you for um, that introduction, for hosting this event, and to Akash for producing what I think is a very good report and a very timely report in terms of where the, where the coalition government is. And we admire your courage in competing with other attractions in the media today and for <laughs> trying to knock them out of the headlines uh, for us. Um, I'm not going to go through, if you'll excuse me, the kind of the, all of the recommendations here. Um, in a sense, I'm going to leave that for the debate and discussions. So you'll probably be relieved to hear that. I just really wanted to make a sort of political contribution about, firstly and very briefly, where the coalition relations are, and then about the issue of what our priorities should be in the second half of the parliament. And, and the thing I wanted to say rather quickly and rather briefly 
which isn't really directly related to your report, but it's the context within which it's viewed, is that obviously compared with the first six months or year of the coalition, we've been through a slightly sort of rougher period, not only in terms of the policy context, but in terms of some of the um, relationships between the two parties over the last few months, you know, and including over the last few days. And that's sort of mentioned in passing in, in Akash's report. I'd like to make the case very briefly, which you'd probably expect me to do anyway, but which I believe to be the case, that actually the coalition is still surprisingly strong. And that if you'd asked um, me privately or many other people, including in the media, before the last election, to anticipate how this coalition would work, particularly in these incredibly difficult times between two parties with very different <coughs> traditions and backgrounds. And you'd ask me now to give the coalition's working relationship a sort of mark out of 10 compared with what I might have expected the range of possibilities to be, I would mark it, its operation very, very highly, more like a nine or a 10 than a zero or one. And although Akash is quite right to say that there isn't a sort of direct comparability between single party government with a number of warring individuals because the challenges in government where you've got two separate parties are very different. I think it is striking that the way in which this coalition government works is probably more effective um, and with a greater degree of cooperation at a senior level in the cabinet, you know, not only between people in the same party, but between the parties than has been the case in the recent past, not least with all of the controversies between Mr. Blair and Mr. Brown when they were in government. And although I wouldn't understate any of the, the kind of disagreements or, or points of tension that there have been this year, I, I think that you have to put those in the wider context of the fact that this government, uh, in spite of all these challenges, works very well not only in terms of the personalities, but the types of process that have been put in place, not least the quad, which means that this is a genuine coalition and partnership of two parties, and not just a, a smaller party sort of tacked on at the back, even though that's sometimes the perception that's given in, in parts of the media. So I wouldn't underestimate the strength of the coalition. And I think that that will remain the case while we have a very clear program of work to do and an agreement about what that work is. So in a sense, the challenge for us looking into the second part of the parliament is to think about what that program of work is and to make sure that we've got our priorities right. The, other, the, the, the bigger issue I wanted to comment on then is what those policy priorities should be and what we should spend our time doing in the second half of the parliament and whether we should have a midterm review and whether we should be looking for new policy ideas and everything. And in spite of the kind of perception around the Queen's speech that perhaps there wasn't new legislation in education and health and welfare and was the government going to run out of an agenda halfway through the Parliament, I mean, I think that the, that the agenda that we set out in the original small coalition agreement that I was involved in was massively ambitious and will take whichever parties are in government, you know, not just one parliament, but well beyond that to deliver. That's not a prediction that the coalition will continue beyond one parliament, but the reform of welfare, the reform of pensions, the reform of the education system, sorting out the deficit, reforming the tax system, the political reform. This is a massively ambitious program, and the idea that you know, somehow we're going to run out of things to do after one or two years, I think is totally delusional. The, the issue is how we will achieve all of these things. And the absolute last thing, in my view, that we need to be doing halfway through the Parliament is finding lots of things to add to the list of things to do. I was already a bit surprised, having spent these days drafting the original, helping to draft the original coalition agreement, when I suddenly discovered that various people have been rushing off drafting this second agreement, which was suddenly sort of lobbed on my desk in my brief time in the Treasury to look at and sort of vet for public spending commitments. And alongside all the really important things, that we thought we'd agreed on, which would take you know five years to deliver, we suddenly committed to a national tree planting program and to sorting out the Balkans and to protecting whistleblowers in the public sector. And suddenly, a, a program that you know probably had 50 important things had, I think, it's 400 different policy commitments in the in the the, the, the later coalition agreement that was published that was put together. So for me, that was already running the risk of adding too many things to the list of priorities and. I think it would be a great mistake to have a review 
that tries to find a new list of things to, to deliver in the second half of the parliament. Instead, I think that the, the, the aim should be to focus on implementation of the things that we are actually doing, to focus on the areas that really matter, and then to think about what the policy developments are in the areas that are our real priorities and how we deal with problems that we didn't necessarily anticipate in May 2010. And very briefly to comment on that, it seems to me that there are three big areas that we really should be spending our time on. And they are clearly the economy, uh, including spending tax, you know, um, the, the challenges in the Eurozone, which are massive issues and in some respects different and more challenging than we inherited in May 2010, not least because of the Eurozone situation. And there are uh, issues about how economic policy needs to develop in order not to set a new path, but to deliver the existing objectives in a tougher environment. And to me, that should be taking you know, more or less 50% of the time of the big figures in the government, because it is the biggest challenge facing the country, and it's multidimensional, and um, <coughs> the challenges in relation to the Eurozone have got greater, and they require new policy responses that weren't anticipated in the, in the first coalition agreement. The second big challenge is clearly the social recovery agenda, which is not just which is not about you know sending more benefits to people to get them above a, an arbitrary poverty line, but it's about the reform of uh, the education system and it's about the welfare to work program. And I think the, the government's perception is in the past there's been a tendency to identify a problem, legislate, and think that the issue is dealt with. I think that this government is much more sensitive to the fact that. It's delivery and implementation that's the key. And in some of the areas, for example, education, the challenge is not to, su to suddenly find a new ambition in education, but to answer questions such as, if you have an education system where there is much more independence for schools and many more academies, how do you then have an effective intervention system that deals with um, the failure in those institutions when they occur, as it inevitably will? And that's an issue not about finding new objectives, but about how you deliver on the existing policy objectives and how you develop policy and ensure that the implementation works. And so if we spend 50% of our time on the economy, when, by, when I say time, I mean time of the big people in the government um, because we've still got 100 ministers and they can do lots of the other things that are less important. If we're going to spend 30% on uh, social recovery, education and welfare, we should probably then be spending a 10% on the issues of political reform, uh, which include um, issues such as lords, boundaries, individual voter registration, party funding reform, issues which are pretty important but don't rank as high for the government as economic and social recovery. And that kind of leaves 10% of people's time to focus on the unexpected and dealing with all of the other issues generated by ministers, which um, are necessary for any government, but aren't the things that we hope to be uh, remembered for. So my conclusion is having a midterm review of some type to identify the progress we've made, to be very clear and focused about what we're going to achieve in this remaining two or three years of the government um, is worthwhile. And looking at the challenges of implementation and the new policies that will have to be developed to deliver the existing aspirations, all those things would be very sensible. But a process that invites our parties to add another 100, 200, 300 uh, policies to this very long list that we've already got is not only not necessary because we've got so much to do, but would also be a massive distraction from us trying to do and deliver on the huge policy agenda that we've already signed up to. Thank you very much indeed, David. Uh, very uh, interesting view of, of, of where, where the uh, coalition should, should go. Margot. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. And uh, congratulations, Akash, and your team for a very interesting report. Uh, I think um, we were all surprised to find um, Britain with a coalition government because I don't think anyone in the room can ever remember one at a national level. Uh, but the report has uh, educated me, and previous institute uh, reports actually into coalitions have educated me into the fact that we are in a minority uh, with that experience. And <laughs> two thirds of governments in Western, um, um, in parliamentary democracies, are in fact coalitions. And um, as Peter said in his introduction, 
we have coalitions around the country, um, not just at a local government level, but more importantly at a regional government level. Um, and so there's plenty of learning to be had from a study <coughs> close to home. And of course, before 1945, uh, at a national level, we had many a coalition government as well. Um, but this, I think, um, uh, when we look forward, and in terms of the discipline and the party management aspects and challenges of coalition, um, when, when we look forward, I think um, we should reflect on the fact that there has been a decline in the support, the core support for the two major parties over the last 30 years. And in 2010, um, a third of the votes, more than a third of the votes, were actually cast for, part, uh, for parties that were not the two major parties, which was the, the, the biggest number of votes um, since 1921. So I, I think it is a trend, and I see it uh, as something that's going to become more frequent. And I make that point because I think that demands of the two major parties um, a slightly harder adjustment than it does of um, smaller parties. Um, the, the programme for government, um, which has guided um, since the coalition agreement, uh, has been the sort of bible of, of this government, it's interesting to see that uh, the Institute of Government's research into what constitutes that programme for government um, assigns 75% of it to Conservative manifesto commitments and 43% to Liberal Democrat um, manifesto commitments with, with a degree of crossover. Uh, and for colleagues of mine who take a rather um, numbers-based view of the level of influence the Liberal Democrats should have on the coalition, um, this, is, this is vexing. And um, we do hear periodic eruptions of, and I hear it from members in, of my own association in my constituency, as well as among colleagues in Parliament, that somehow the, the smaller party's tail is wagging the larger party's dog. And I think, really, that stems from a rather comfortable half century that the major parties have had, where votes have had different values, haven't they, really? It's taken fewer votes to give a majority party a majority um, uh, than, um, than it has to give the smaller parties the number of seats they've had in Parliament. But if the votes used to have different value, um, the seats now have a different value, because, of course, if you've got a in the balance of power, or effectively, um, your numbers of seats um, and the numbers of votes that got you those seats are going to have a greater value uh, per seat than the numbers of seats of the majority party. So I think that we have to get used to that. When I was last in this room, it was a couple of weeks after the 2010 election, and new MPs like myself were coming to get some um, uh, guidance in our new roles. And I remember... Um, one of the cabinet office officials who had been drafted in to give us that guidance um, said that um, when they'd had a seminar in the period between the election and the coalition coming into being, um, the title of that seminar had been um, Governing as if Parliament Mattered, which I thought was quite <laughs> salutary. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and I suppose our, our experience has been, I think, that Parliament has mattered more um, than, than previous parliaments. Uh, and I think that's a very healthy thing. So on the game of two halves, the learnings um, from other countries that I took from your study uh, were that the program that normally takes longer to negotiate in countries which are more used to having coalitions than they did with the, the more sort of shotgun wedding approach that we had in the UK, um, that once those treaties or programs for government are written in stone in the early days, um, renegotiation in a formal sense is much more difficult the longer the parliament continues. And um, the, the sort of transaction costs involved are far greater. Um, often the nature of the crisis um, that is engulfing whatever government is in power has changed. Um, and as the next election approaches, as you pointed out in the report, um, the investment that the parties, even at the top, have in the marriage um, declines in sort of inverse relationship um, to their potential parties' advantage when that marriage 
is known to be coming to an end um, as a general election approaches. So I think it becomes more and more difficult, which is one of the reasons I concur with um, David Laws's point that rather than looking for new policy development areas, we should really be focusing on making what we've done work and concluding the policy agenda that we set in the, in the programme for government. And, and I, I would support that. Um, we have an advantage in that we, we've passed the Fixed Term Parliament Act, so short of a, 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 an un, a very unexpected catastrophe, the, sh the coalition should go to the full term, um, or at least very nearly. Um, but that does present a number of challenges, some, many of which David touched on. Um, on the party management side, the coalition is very much like a triangle, and I agree with, with David. From what I see, obviously as a backbencher, I don't experience it directly, but what, from what I see, um, the relationships at, within the cabinet level and, and within ministerial level um, are pretty solid between the parties. Um, but it's like a pyramid. <coughs> Once you get out to the, the, the flatter end of that pyramid, um, our respective part, parties in the country and even our backbenchers in parliament, um, that relationship, um, I think, is, is more fractured, really, now than, than it ever was. Um, and that will give um, significant challenges to party management in parliament, um, presumably of both parties, certainly my own. Um, and... So I think it is the, the challenges we have, really, as a government, are to get back on the, the front foot. Um, we had a very good momentum. Um, I'm glad it is a game of two halves, because I wouldn't want the umpire to come onto the field now and blow the final whistle. Um, there's, we, we did make a, a very good um, start and middle run, and the last couple of months, um, <coughs> things have um, been far more challenging. And we've got to get back on the front foot. Uh, and I think we do this not by reviewing too much um, uh, where we've come from or um, new developments going forward, but far more in terms of making sure the commitments we made as a coalition <coughs> government uh, and that we have in part implemented actually work. And the scale of the reform in public services is huge. Uh, the NHS noise over the last 12 months has rather drowned out the other reforms that have been made of the, of the police and of the schools um, and, and of higher education. And those reforms have to work. Uh, they've been quite controversial, um, but I think that they've been very well, very well thought out. And for anybody who thinks that we need to change the way that um, services are delivered and the eligibility criteria the, the cost and the value, if you're committed to that agenda, as, uh, as we are in government, I think, uh, then I think one is committed to seeing through those reforms against um, an ever more challenging um, economic um, background, which isn't going to change the side of uh, the next election very much, in my view. Uh, so those are the, the, the big crisis, of course, on the Eurozone and the general Western um, economic malaise uh, thank goodness there is growth elsewhere in the world, and I think Britain is particularly well favoured to take advantage of that growth in some of those growth markets. Um, so that is something that could be some good, good economic news as the next election approaches. Uh, so I think um, the, the lessons from coalitions around the world, um, I'd like to just finish by the Irish one, which I think they've decided that in their coalition, what they wanted to do midway was to reaffirm and emphasise their coalition's priorities, and I think that's just what our coalition government should do. And there's a lot, there's enough work in achieving that <coughs> over the next couple of years, without um, embarking on a completely new set of policy planks. Thank you very much indeed, Margot. I mean, it's interesting for both you and David. No big coalition mark two parties. You say there's a lot to achieve, and 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 the sense of party legislation. <laughs> is the first part, and implementation is crucial, and I think we'll see that when we, we see the uh, sort of social reform plan uh, later this month. I mean, that connection on that. Now, Jack, you've actually experienced that. You've been through, n not entirely successfully, an attempt to <laughs> renew uh, a, a, a coalition government that given the, the result in 2007. Uh, what are the challenges when you get to the second half? Because, I mean, you, you faced a fixed time, in your case, for four years. How do you do it? Well, I think one of the most interesting things that's been said so far is just how much of a challenge to political culture in the UK uh, coalitions are. And, uh, you know, I think we should not underestimate that. And I think it is very valuable to keep some perspective, as I think David has done, uh, 
um, on how much progress the coalition has made given where it started. Uh, um, I don't think things are as serious for the coalition just now as everybody appears to be reporting and I, and I, uh, I think it still at least appears of, from the outside to have a central sense of purpose and that will, uh, um, that will be key over the next 18 months or so. Um, but I was struck recently, I came in on the train with an MP from Scotland, uh, one of my own party colleagues, uh, about uh, three weeks ago after the Scottish local elections and in his area, which had been traditionally a Labour local authority area, um, the Labour Party had just lost overall control of the council in the local elections at the beginning of May and he reminded me in his view and in the view of all his local party activists this was all my fault um, <laughs> because of the proposal representation system that had been introduced uh, by my administration back in, uh, in 2005 and uh, um, oh, don't put the Tories off constitutional. Oh, <laughs> well, he seemed to have he, he seemed to have no no understanding of the fact that it may be because locally the Labour Party hadn't achieved anything near to forty percent of the vote. Never mind fifty percent of the vote, um, and there may be some problems at a local level uh, rather than with the electoral system. Uh, but I thought it was interesting that even even now after all those years, even just in local government in Scotland, there is still that cultural. Um, antipathy to the idea that the elect, what the electorate votes for might actually be uh, what is desired and therefore that parties might have to work together in order to make uh, government either at the local um, Scottish, Welsh, Northern Irish or, uh, or UK um, level. I want to say something very briefly about the, um, the six years that I uh, led the coalition government in Scotland because I do think there are um, periods there that, that might be of interest to, the, to this discussion but I also want to comment on where I think... Uh, the, uh, the coalition will face challenges over the next two years. I took over as First Minister in 2001 um, at a time when uh, we'd had a very difficult first two years in the Scottish Parliament, a lot of instability. I was the third First Minister in uh, just over two years. And uh, what had been quite a stable coalition in the first few weeks uh, had become uh, really quite ropey in the Parliament, uh, even with the reasonable majority that we had at that time. Um, and the first thing I was struck by which I hadn't really thought through in advance of becoming Scottish Labour leader in order to then become First Minister, um, was that I faced a vote in the Parliament. Uh, in, the, in, in the Scottish Parliament, unlike the UK Parliament, it's not the Queen that chooses the First Minister. Uh, the Parliament recommends the First Minister to the Queen. And you have to actually win a vote in the Parliament before you can then uh, go through all the other uh, uh, procedures. And um, that meant that I needed to get the positive votes of the Liberal Democrats, not just their acquiescence to a new head of the coalition, but actually their positive vote in the parliament. Um, and it meant that I had to basically go along to the Liberal Democrat group and give them a whole bundle of assurances about the coalition agreement, agreement we already had in place. And that was the first time it really brought home to me that just over two years into a four-year agreement, the actual agreement that had been reached in May 1999 was still important uh, to the junior partner in the, in the coalition. Um, and it wasn't going to be possible for me, despite being a new First Minister, to suddenly go off on my own track and start reinventing what Scottish Labour stood for uh, or developing what Scottish Labour stood for without having some uh, agreement from the Liberal Democrat uh, colleagues. That said, I think we did reasonably well, partly because Jim Wallace was established as the Deputy First Minister. We did reasonably well in the period up to 2003 in uh, managing the first election when both parties were going into an election in coalition but wanting to campaign separately, obviously, in the, in the spring of 2003. Um, but that, I think we were helped at that time by a relatively weak opposition. Uh, I think if we'd been really challenged by the opposition at that time, the fact that we were not really distinguishing each other, uh, particularly clearly, uh, might have been uh, um, uh, more easily exposed. <coughs> I think we really benefited, and I think this is where the current coalition benefits from having a central purpose. I think we really benefited from having a central purpose between 2003 and 2007. Despite the eventual result in May 2007, uh, when I lost office, the fact that we had as a core purpose trying to uh, rebuild and re-energise the Scottish economy, which had gone through <coughs> three or four years of really uh, big problems due to investment in... Uh, uh, um, high volume manufacturing going east, first eastern Europe and then to, uh, to China. Um, uh, we had that as a key central purpose uh, of the administration, gave us something to continually refer back to in terms of the decision making over budgets and, 
so on. And secondly, at the centre of a legislative programme, we had a, a massive modernisation of criminal justice, which gave us a legislative programme that was constantly being energised and updated. Um, and therefore, I think we, as, a, as an administration, we held together really quite well, despite having a very small majority, I think down to four at one point, um, between 2003 and 2007. The big problem for me, reflecting back on that time, is what happened between 2005 and 2007. And I think there are lessons here for, the, for, for both David Cameron and Nick Clegg uh, and where they are today. Um, in 2005, Jim Wallace resigned as Scottish Liberal Democrat leader. They had a new leader in place. Uh, ideas that I had at that time about re-energising and having a mid-term review of policy and programme uh, were put to one side because we had to have a bit of stability with the new leader. Um, and we lost an opportunity, in my view, at that time to refresh the cabinet to, uh, and to refresh the, 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 the overall programme and the way that we were working. And then I think even more seriously between 2006 and 2007, um, we really suffered from not having the ability to publicly in government uh, set out an agenda for the future that went beyond 2007. Uh, we spent almost all our time talking about delivering what we had agreed we would do between 2003 and 2007 and almost no time in government, despite the fact a lot of work was going on, talking about what would happen afterwards. Because that would have, that, that would have necessitated a, a level of agreement between the two parties on our manifestos for 2007 that was never going to be possible. So although there were all kinds of radical ideas kicking around, I think particularly on our side about education, for what would happen after 2007 in the next term, it was just impossible as uh, First Minister to really get out there and campaign for those ideas, to publish a green paper, to, um, to hold consultations, to get discussions going, to publish research, that kind of thing. And I think this is a, this is a period that the, the, the current coalition here is going gonna, is gonna to find really, really tricky. The UK parties are used to the pre-election period, the 18, 24 months before an election, setting out their stall, doing so vigorously, increasingly their lives being dominated by the forthcoming election and not by what has come before. But the coalition is going to be dominated by finishing the delivery of what they agreed at that point nearly five years before. Um, and I'm not sure that either party will have thought enough about how they will actually find the scope in government to go out there and campaign for the, about the future rather than just talk about what's happening in the present or has happened in the immediate past. So in, in, in relation to the policy, I think a midterm review is a good idea. I think the ideas in Akash's paper about external challenge and so on are very helpful. Um, but I think the biggest policy challenge is going to be setting out an agenda for the future and finding a way as separate parties to campaign for that while still trying to deliver something that was agreed in 2010. The second thing I think is, is, is critical is personnel. Um, there are a lot of good people in, the, in, this, in this government, and my, my perception is that most individual departments are running much more effectively than they were certainly in the later years of, of Labour being in power. Um, but uh, it's starting to look tired, and refreshing the personnel in a coalition government is really, really hard. Uh, moving people, even in your own party, never mind moving people in the other party, moving them around or replacing them, bringing in new faces is a real challenge. Uh, I think David Cameron needs to do that this year. Um, I think the current tensions uh, over one or two areas in, in the coalition might, uh, might hold him back from doing that, and I think that would be a, a serious uh, problem. And I think also that, will be a, that there will be an issue there for the civil service, and Alec may have uh, thoughts on this. Um, you know, I think civil servants like, to have, they like stability, but they also like new ideas and, and personnel being refreshed. And I'm not sure that uh, uh, if you keep exactly the same people in every department over the course of the next 18 months or so, then um, you're not going to look really tired as a government and start to run out of uh, um, steam and energy. And then just finally to pick up on David's uh, uh, final remarks about the, uh, the, 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 challenge, the policy challenges that both parties need to look at. Um, I, I, if I can come back to my point about the need to express a vision for the future post-2015. Um, I think uh, in, 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 in the areas where the two parties might most radically diverge, for example, Europe, um, where we desperately need some British politicians to be talking about what our future vision of the European Union uh, and European relationships are. We don't really have anybody in British politics at the moment talking about that in a serious way. Um, 
how are the two parties, if they are true to uh, their core instincts, if not values, uh, going to be able to do that? Because presumably the visions of the two leaders would be really quite radically different. But that would be, to me, one of the really big issues of the 2015 election, is where does Britain stand in Europe and where does Europe stand in the world? Um, and a, as an example of an area where policy divergence um, could, uh, uh, could be really important for the identity of both parties in the next election. Um, but because of the nature of the policy divergence being so severe, compromises and perhaps timidity might take over and therefore it not be expressed, um, that could give both parties some real difficulties and leave a massive opening for the opposition. Maybe not so much Labour, but certainly for UKIP. Uh, to come in there and fill the gap. So I think there are, uh, there are some interesting issues there um, in the run-up to 2015 about how in, on, on issues like Europe, um, how do the parties find a way of expressing their vision for the future while still focusing on the very important issues of delivery that Margot and, and David have identified. Thank you very much indeed, Jack. It's a very, very interesting point to say, particularly, um, if I might say, on you know, developing policy for the future, because I, th I think and it comes out in, in, in the report it is very, very difficult to do that. You, you can look back and implement, and there's a lot to implement, of the 2010 agreement and deficit reduction and spending around are all there. But anything which goes further ahead, when you've got a coalition which uh, uh, not, not only, as you say, in some areas like Europe, has sharply d d different approaches, but also raises some very awkward um, issues anyway. I think it's very, very difficult to do, and I think one of the most di difficult questions is thinking ahead. Um, in that can, way. can I give one example yeah. of that, just as I take, take a bit of a liberty, and that is publishing bills. Great tactic of majority governments in the UK over the last 20, 30 years, both Conservative and Labour, and the run up to an election is to publish the bill <coughs> that you will implement if you are re-elected, and to challenge the opposition about what they would do instead. Mm. Now, if you haven't got a fresh coalition agreement for May or June 2015, and you've got two parties campaigning separately, you can't get two parties to agree the content of the bill that would be published that would then challenge the opposition to respond. Mm -hmm. So, that, and, and, and those sort of campaign tactics that are normally the, the, you know, the very basics of some of the campaigning that goes on in advance of an election, not possible with a coalition government in a way it's possible with a single party government. And that's going to need a whole new way of thinking. So, um, Alex Allen was very much involved, <coughs> I mean, partly he's had long experience because he was um, a principal private secretary. Um, both to John Major and to um, initially for, for at the beginning of Tony Blair's spell. So he's seen one, one transition. But also he was involved uh, on behalf of Gus O'Donnell in a lot of the uh, coordination preparatory work um, ahead of the last election and thinking through the machinery of government, uh, well, not machinery of government, but how, how, how the transition should be managed. And the, he was very helpful to us in the uh, Institute on that. But particularly, um, he was involved in a, as I mentioned, a, a famous occasion of um, a scenario playing of, of the outcome of the election, which didn't quite turn out. How can the civil service deal with the unexpected uh, um, political development, Alex? Well, thank you, Peter. And um, the... I mean, as you say, I mean, one of the, I, I was quite involved before the election in the, in the planning, and um, the scenario exercise you described was one where we, I mean, I produced a number of scenarios, and we had uh, Gus O'Donnell playing himself, and Jeremy Hayward then in number 10 playing himself, and uh, various uh, civil servants playing at being David Cameron and Nick Clegg and Gordon Brown. And um, we presented, you know, scenarios for the election outcomes in terms of numbers of seats and, um, you know, f tried to work out what the consequence would be. And one of the ones we presented turned out to be almost exactly the uh, outcome of the 2010 election, where, you know, we singularly failed to uh, uh, get to a coalition agreement and, you know, had a minority conservative government as the outcome. And I do think that one of the things that, um, and, and, and um, Akash brings it out in his report, is that the uh, civil service will be much more attuned uh, this time round to the, all the possible outcomes and will, I th I'm sure, do a lot more work on that. I mean, one of the things Margot said that, you know, we know the date of the election, and that's actually also quite significant for civil service preparations because... Um, I mean, previously, we've had this sort of rather unsatisfactory uh, convention, effectively, that 
the gun was fired on when you could begin discussions with the opposition and begin election planning, normally in January, about sort of 16 months before the last possible date for an election. Um, and this was done on, um, th this tended either to produce uh, too short a period when we got into the cycle that governments who thought they were going to win, get re-elected, would call an election after four years. So you ended up with rather a short uh, period between when the gun was fired and the election actually took place, or as in 2010 when governments not sure they're going to win and hang on to the last possible moment, you end up with 16 months, which actually turns out to be too long, and you start off with lots of enthusiasm and then rather run out of steam and you have a great fallow period in the middle. Um, so this time round, I mean, there will be much, be able to plan much more clearly about um, when the um, issues can be discussed and thought through. Um, I think that we've got quite a lot to learn from Scotland in particular. And I mean, before the 2010 election, we had quite a bit of discussions with John Eldridge, who was then the permanent secretary uh, in Scotland. And um, the, uh, where they had a system where they actually set up um, small teams supporting each of the uh, parties. And I mean, it, it does call into question about how the civil service will uh, deal within government with uh, Liberal Democrat and Conservative uh, parties, both interested in help in securing advice on the development of some of their policies. Um, I think Jack makes a very good point that you know the, the tradition for the party in government has been you know a plethora of green papers, draft legislation, and giving the civil service a pretty clear idea of what the program uh, for the next government would be you know, well before the manifesto. There are always things held back for the manifesto itself. Uh, and that's something which will be much harder this time round for the reasons Jack outlined. Um, I think that, I mean, Akash in his report um, <clears throat> discusses the sort of Scottish model of having a central, small central teams who the various parties could uh, deal with to help um, get advice on um, policy proposals. Uh, I, I, and, and actually concludes, I think, that it would be rather, I mean, given the size of Whitehall and the complexities, that it would be better to um, farm it out to departments with each department doing its own part of that. I'm not sure that is actually going to be feasible. I think that there will need to be some centrally coordinated process whereby um, the two parties can commission work from teams within the cabinet office dedicated to actually sorting them, and then they can in turn go out and uh, talk to departments. Um, I think having a you know, separate process in each department uh, risks being uh, extremely chaotic. Um, I mean, there does, Akash raises the point about, well, then what about the sort of equity versus the Labour Party? I mean, I suspect that that, um, in practice, will end up in, in the same sort of process we've grown accustomed to in dealing with, in previously, two opposition parties, that there will be um, discussions with them um, held separately and outside the uh, government process. Um, I mean, I think that the, as I said, the civil service will undoubtedly want to plan for all possible outcomes. I mean, the political parties, um, as, Akash, as Akash's report says, will themselves no doubt have an eye to what may um, happen after the election. And of course, our voting system, as is well known, actually does make it quite hard for uh, parties to get majorities, notwithstanding the... Um, you know, the, the work we've grown to expect. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think it's extremely implausible to believe that political parties will trim their manifestos very much towards, oh, well, this is what we may do for a coalition. I think it will be much more uh, likely they will set out their positions and, and, you know, consider extremely privately what uh, room they may have for manoeuvre if it comes to coalition negotiations. Um, I think, as I said, the civil service will undoubtedly want to uh, become much more uh, have really thought through how coalition agreements of any groupings might be formed or what might be 
uh, possible in terms of minority governments with confidence and supply, support from another party. Um, and I mean, that is, is quite challenging because one of the things that was absolutely clear in 2010 was that the, um, the process of doing the negotiations was something where the political parties felt it was absolutely for them to do. And they, by and large, only wanted minimal civil service support. You know, some of it just literally making sure they got coffee and uh, biscuits, and um, some of it uh, occasionally being answer answering factual questions um, in the margins of the discussions. And I mean, I, you know, it will be an open question how far any particular grouping after the election will want. Uh, civil service support. I'm sure the civil service will need to make sure it's in a position to uh, provide that support and so I think it will involve a lot more uh, analysis of the various manifestos and looking at how they can be put together and, and what in, in agreements might emerge. But as I say, I mean, it, how much that at the end of the day uh, parties will want civil service advice or support and that is something that's an open question. Um, but I think the civil service will need to become very much more sort of expert on this. I mean, one of the things that was quite striking in 2010 that the person who was supposedly the greatest expert on the Liberal Democrat manifesto was in fact Oliver Letwin. Um, <laughs> so, um, is that, I mean, just going back and, and picking up a few more general points, I mean, I do think one of the... Um, various people have talked about the challenges for political parties of a coalition and there are challenges for the civil service too and um, we've learnt a number of uh, issues I mean you know particularly in things like providing support um, I mean Nick Clegg in the early days of government was clearly under resourced in terms of the idea was that he'd sort of share everything with the Prime Minister in number 10 and they'd operate um, uh, you know, out of using the same team. In practice, that didn't work very well, and uh, the support for Nick Clegg has had to be beefed up quite considerably. And equally, David Cameron, I mean, felt that he could operate um, out of a much smaller number 10 and has subsequently had to build up uh, the policy unit there. Um, I mean, there are, have, of course, been advantages for the civil service. Um, I mean, one of the things has been you know, a much clearer process for resolving some of the, dis uh, um, the disputes. And as David said, you know, the Quad has proved a, a really powerful and effective mechanism. And, I mean, I, I, I've got mixed feelings about what Jack said about reshuffles. Um, I mean, I think, you know, I would place quite a high premium on the stability that uh, is, 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 a, is provided by uh, avoiding the sort of annual reshuffle round. Um, and, you know, again, going back to my number 10 experience, I mean, reshuffles are really appalling, bloody processes where, you know, you start off one night with a, with a and this is, in, you know, in a single party government, you used to start off one night with a plan for who would go where. And, you know, by early the next morning after the first few interviews, that had inevitably fallen apart. And you'd end up the day and you'd look at the list that emerged relative to the list you'd planned and think, you know, this was two completely different uh, uh, governments. So, uh, I mean, I think that, you know, the idea <laughs> that uh, um, coalitions make reshuffles harder is actually probably, a, on balance, a plus. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed uh, uh, on that note, Alex. So just before we open it up, I mean, one of the most interesting themes which has emerged is um, the constraints at the end of the poll, the point you made very vividly, Jack, and it's also implicit in what Margot and, uh, and David were saying, that you, there isn't the political will to reopen everything. But does that mean that necessary difficult decisions won't be taken, David? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, so on public I, spending, I mean, I mean you I, saw how your, you know, your successor chief secretary, um, at the time of the PBR, when he talked about, when there was the, talking about public spending after the election, ran into a lot of trouble with your colleagues. Yes, but I mean, what the government was doing at that time was, was very sensible, responding mm. to uh, the, the big problems that there were in the Eurozone, uh, therefore acknowledging that the period of austerity and consolidating the public finances was going to take longer. Um, if we'd not been willing to look at the projections for, for spending and borrowing beyond the election, then we would have had to have taken some of those difficult decisions in this parliament, which I don't think would have been very sensible under the changed economic 
uh, environment. I mean, I, think, I suspect that both coalition parties would not expect there to be lots of new policy making going on in that last year of government, and I suspect that there usually isn't even in single party governments, as, as Jack sort of acknowledged, because he's making a rather different point. And because I think we're fairly clear what our big policy objectives are, um, there is no reason for us to be doing a lot of new thinking as opposed to implementation in the last year. The challenge clearly will be that, that both parties will be wanting to set out visions for the future that relate to the next general election, and they will be wanting to set out competing visions uh, in, some, in some areas, not in all areas. But I think a, a counterweight to the risk that that will lead to a, a very sort of fractious and difficult last year is that it will still be, I suspect, strongly in the interests of both parties to demonstrate that they are delivering good, coherent coalition government that's tackling the ongoing challenges the country faces and isn't delivering the appearance of a last year which would look sort of shambolic, disorganized, and argumentative. And therefore, I think both Nick Clegg and David Cameron will have a very strong interest in discussing privately how they manage that last year so that the government is still seen to be delivering, so that the country doesn't think that the government has somehow given up and is just fighting itself, but so that they can both set out in their own time in a sensible way <coughs> their different views about the future of the country and anticipating the different manifestos that both parties will put to the country in May 2015. Michael, isn't there a sense amongst your colleagues, uh, if only we could be free of those um, Lib Dems, there's, there's a kind of frustration that look at all the wonderful things we could do only if, and that, that will increasingly affect what could be done in the second half of the parliament, and that perhaps some awkward things won't be done, because you'll all be hoping for liberation. Um, there's some, definitely some truth in what you say, but I think that's been a, a fairly convenient scapegoat all along, really, among some colleagues. But uh, I, I think um, others among us feel that, um, that there's enough very good um, conservative liberal ideas mm. going forward in this government. I, I alluded to the public service reforms, which I think are extremely important and um, I think benefit from having a coalition behind them rather than just a single party in government behind them. Um, and I think that, that the benefits that the coalition will bring to that, that reform agenda being implemented um, will, uh, will continue. So I, I don't take that view, but I am aware that it does exist. Just, Jack, in your final two years, 2005 to 7, were decisions not taken which you would like, in retrospect, or even perhaps at the time, thought should have been taken? Um. <coughs> um, I don't think there were particular decisions that, that, that weren't taken, but I think there are things that we could have been doing um, that would have, uh, at the very least in a presentational sense, indicated some momentum uh, and energy that, 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 that were just not possible. So there was a lot of, we had a, we had a group called the, the uh, Futures Unit working in the government that was looking at long-term scenario planning, comparing Scotland with other small countries um, and other parts of the world, looking at what we needed to do to be in a stronger position by 2020 and so on. Uh, they were producing a lot of good policy work, uh, but actually publishing that work and turning it into um, the kind of political commitment that would then have, uh, one, energised the government, but secondly also perhaps energised the voters, um, became very difficult because the two parties had a different view on, on what the, uh, the level of priority to give to, 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 some of those, uh, to some of those ideas. I, think, I actually think the biggest challenge for, for this coalition um, in, in terms of ideas is not so much brand new ideas for them to implement by 2015, but what do they do with ideas um, that have either hit the buffers a little bit, like the big society, for example, which, I mean, even I, in the opposition, was quite energised about yeah. in 2010, but it seems to me to have, you know, just hit the buffers, uh, and the Prime Minister's got to do something about that between now and 2015, or are, frankly, um, wrong. You know, the idea that we, we're planning now because it happened to be in a coalition agreement to elect to, to, to set up a, a Senate with 15-year senators who are not, never uh, up for re-election. 
seems to me to be illiberal, and, and, yet, and yet we've got a coalition that's committed to it um, uh, because the status, the position of the Liberal Democrat leader is, is, is so closely associated with it. So I think, there's a, I think there's an issue about what do they do with some of the existing ideas to either refresh them or be more flexible about them so that they make more sense. Uh, but I don't think they necessarily need to add all sorts of new things into their programme. The big challenge is in those final 18, 24 months, having enough ideas out there um, to energise their parties and the public uh, in, a, in an election period and set out a vision for the future, which is what elections are all about. They're not just about delivery. Um, you know, uh, we, we, might, we might like to think they're about delivery, but they're not. They're about vision for the future and, uh, and people making a choice on, on that basis. Good. Now let's open up to questions. Um, um, could you say who you are and, uh, Lauren, uh, right at the back, just by the camera at the back. And could I also say that, um, just point one or two of my former colleagues, uh, Alex Allen will not be discussing his role <laughs> as Ministerial Advisor this afternoon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Richard Graham, MP for Gloucester, former diplomat. Um, as a Conservative MP, Peter, first of all, uh, big thank you to the Institute for Government, because actually this is the sort of discussion which precisely we cannot have in Parliament. So it's very good to come over here uh, and have it with all of you. Second thing I'd say is that um, I don't spend any time at all uh, thinking about the wonderful things we could do if we didn't have the Lib Dems with us because the simple practical truth is that actually without our coalition partners we could achieve very little at all and we'd have to go back to the country fairly quickly. Second thing I would say is on this excellent report, um, it mentions as time passes the incentives grow to emphasize differences over unity. I mean I think interestingly the only significant differences of policy are really focused on Europe and the Constitution. And in a sense, the major differences there are really within the parties rather than between the parties. And because the Conservative Party, A, has significantly more MPs and B, is arguably a broader church anyway, the significant differences are probably within the Conservative Party rather than the Lib Dems. And interestingly there, I think the significant public trends are quite simply that most people are more skeptic about EU interference in general from whichever institution it comes and more skeptical really about the value of tinkering with the process of the Constitution and more worried about the quality of decision making and implementation. And these things I think, Peter, actually now influence government more than they did under the previous government, i.e. there is more bottom-up input. What the public is thinking certainly impacts us as MPs, and in turn that certainly impacts the government. And the best way to measure that, in a sense, is the hugely different approach that this government is taking and will go on taking to Syria, rather than the approach the previous government took to Iraq and Afghanistan. So I mentioned the word implementation, which brings me really to my third and last major point. Um, at the bottom of page one, you talk about a significant proportion of the coalition's energy over the next two, three years will be on implementation. David gave that a huge amount of support. I would absolutely agree with this, but I would give it a slight twist, which is this. I think, having seen government from the other side, uh, and now coming, it, uh, coming to it from, uh, from this side, that the biggest danger of government in making decisions is that as soon as it's made them, it believes they're done. So you announce a new incentive for small companies who have never taken on an apprentice to be paid 1,500 pounds in two slices if they do so. You've done it. Your civil servants tell you that that should generate X thousand or 100,000 new apprentices. It's happened, in your mind, as a minister already. But actually on the ground, the very small companies who make up the Federation of Small Businesses and so on haven't even heard about the policy, haven't looked at it, don't know about it, are suspicious that it's going to be bureaucratic and long-winded, and you need MPs as champions to go out there and sell the policy. MPs in the coalition government should be the marketing arm of the government on the ground. My very last point, because I know there are lots of people who want to talk, is really for the media. I think, in terms of a game of two halves, that the second half is going to have two halves within it. And the current focus, which is all very much on differences within the coalition, you know, is there going to be a new policy agenda? You know, how is it all going on the Leveson inquiry and all the rest of it? I think we'll shift back a bit and the media will start thinking, hang on, what are the alternatives to a coalition government? Can anyone actually remember any single opposition policy at all other than spend more? <laughs>
And so I think that the game will change and the implementation will both be for us as a coalition government to get on with and the implementation of some actual policy from the opposition will come Thank under you. the microscope. Thank you, Richard. We'll take two or three points together. Uh, Patrick Winter there. Um, Patrick Winter from The Guardian. Can I just ask David very briefly, um, one of the issues you're going to face is a spending review presumably next year and one of the difficulties for you will be that that will carry over into the next election some of the spending proposals and ideas in there. And I was just wondering how you handle that because doesn't that implicitly require you to have a common programme post 2015 or is there a way in which you can say well we've got an agreed uh, sort of spending envelope but we openly disagree about how we spend that money? Right, we'll, we'll, take, we'll take one more in this round. The gentleman, in front, just, yeah, the, no, no, hold on, no, yeah. Hello, Hartley Miller, Management Partners. Um, I spend quite a bit of time in Holland and observe the <coughs> various uh, iterations of the coalition forming process there. And it does strike me that um, they have found various ways around this problem of giving yourself a profile um, independently of the coalition to which you belong. But they almost all involve some form of um, flag um, or spokesperson who is not the leader of the party. And the question in my mind really is whether parties here will develop this too, whether perhaps um, Boris Johnson will be the person who's putting forward the ideas that the Conservatives would like to carry forward. Um, perhaps um, some allegiances will take place whereby it's possible to get the message out there without actually undermining the, um, the position of the leader of the party. But I'm not sure that that will happen in our system. I think that anything other than the leader of the party putting it forward is likely to be a problem, and perhaps we've got to get over yeah. it. That's a very interesting point, that one. Um, of, 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 we've got three very diverse questions there, and I'll come back to some others in a minute. David, and then I'll run along. Um, shall I just pick up a couple of the yeah, points? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, not, not you I pick mean, up which on, you want to. On Patrick's point, I mean, it is already clear that there will have to be some other spending review in this parliament. Um, Firstly, because the existing spending review runs out in 1415, and we will literally be in 2015 16 when the general election presumably takes place. So, we, we can't have a situation where going into that year, departments don't have any budgets, basically. Um, and Danny has already anticipated that by, by talking about the next spending review. Um, there will also obviously be more pressure for the government to say more about it general spending envelope depending upon where we are in the process of deficit reduction and the more progress we've made the less pressure there will be to have detailed plans and the less um, progress that we've made in deficit reduction depending upon what's going on in Europe um, there will be countervailing forces in the markets so far I don't think that the government has made a decision on how much detail is going to go into that spending review whether it takes place in 2013 or in early 2014. And I think that the question that you rightly anticipate, you know, will have to be thought through very carefully, that there will be some reasons to, to take some decisions prior to um, that go into the next parliament, not least because we will literally be in the next um, uh, spending year when we hold a general election. So it's not really an option to have no idea at all what we're spending in a, in a year that we'll be in. But I think both parties will want to maintain um, a degree of freedom and flexibility about spending issues going into the next parliament because we will be presenting um, two separate manifestos with different sets of priorities. So you're quite right to raise the issue and the government will at the right time have to reconcile those two different pressures, some of which would be pressuring the government to have a lot of detail, and others of which, in terms of differentiation, would be arguing for a degree of wiggle room. I mean, the, the only other point I'll, I'll pick up, because I don't want to take up too much of the response time, is, is really Europe has come up a few times. And obviously, uh, it's a very important issue. Uh, and obviously, it, it has um, potential to be difficult in the coalition, both within the Conservative Party um, and between the two parties, I think. I think what makes it particularly difficult for us to set out a strategy on it is that the really crucial changes are going on within the Eurozone, of which we are not a part. 
and what makes it difficult both to set out a forward strategy and to be taking any leadership role is that quite a lot of policy making in the European area during this parliament is probably going to be a British response to developments out of the Eurozone of which we are not part of. And that, that is a challenge for us looking forward. And it's also a challenge in that there's a risk that you end up having to make policy in a responsive, reactive, short-term way, which is more challenging, I think, for a coalition than, than being able to think it through. Joe, do, do you um, want to just pick up what you have? Yeah, I think, I, mean, I, I, I think I, I, I am concerned about the European thing, as I said, uh, I said earlier. I think, I think uh, um, the country is crying out for a proper debate uh, about the European Union. I think there is a desperate need for some leadership on this. I, I think uh, um, in a coalition where the two parties are so uh, traditionally have such, had such different views, um, even if perhaps the two leaders are not that far apart um, in reality, uh, uh, is, is, is restricting us from that. And I worry about the fact that we might go into 2015 without any of the three main parties really having a clear view about where the European Union goes uh, next. I think the British politics is crying out for somebody to be pro-European. Um, and I, and you know, I think there's a, there's a bit of space there, and I don't see anybody filling that gap. And I, so I, I, I think we could end up with a, a kind of slight, slightly strange debate leading up to, uh, to 2015 on that. Um, I think on the point about, about um, alternative spokespeople, um, believe me, I tried it, and it doesn't work. Uh, um, I mean, in, the, in some ways, there's a, there's a slightly better uh, 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 history of this in the UK level than there would be in either Scotland or Wales or or Northern Ireland, where the, 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 the role of political leadership is maybe less developed uh, uh, over the last decade or so. Um, because you've, you have had over the years people like, I mean, probably best known example would be Cecil Parkinson or Norman Tebbit or something like that. The role of the Tory party chairman has had that, has almost had that role over the, over, over the years. Um, uh, but certainly in Scotland, when I tried in advance of uh, 2007 election to counter the, the significantly higher profile that Alex Salmon had in comparison to his predecessor um, by uh, using colleagues to go out there and speak for Labour, even when I was still speaking for the coalition. Um, I mean, it had virtually no impact at all, and it was actually, if anything, it turned out to be a negative, and it looked as if I wasn't willing to, rather than that we were trying to do it. Um, and it, and uh, so I think, um, I mean, really, the two leaders have to sort this one out, and they need to find a way of operating. Uh, um, and it's not going to be easy. And, but I think all of us need to try and help that because it would be very, very unhealthy if we have a general election in 2015 in the UK where we don't have robust political debate. This, 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 the size of the challenges facing the country demand that. And I think all of us have got a duty to try and help create a debate that is genuinely three party or, or maybe more. That's right. Briefly, Margaret. Um, <coughs> I, don't, I think most of the points mm. that the audience have raised have uh, been dealt with. Good. So, unless you want me to... No, 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 we'll come in finally. Um, I just want to amplify David's point about the uh, actually having to deal with spending in 2015-16 before the um, election. I mean, actually, you know, it isn't just that they need to, departments need to know their budgets by the time of the election. It's actually that if they're going to be cuts in their budget, they will need to have you know, several months or, you know, quite a few months before have actually introduced the policies and, and made the plans to do it because you can't just start at the beginning of the year and say, whoops, I'm going to cut whatever percentage off my budget. You need to start ahead of it. Mm -hmm. right. Now, we've got, we've got time for one quick, right at the back there, um, um, Robert Hazel, then the gentleman in front of him. Yeah. Robert Hazel, fellow here and uh, from the Constitution Unit. And, and uh, author of uh, complementary work. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> a book called The Politics of Coalition being published next week. And as Peter and I were discussing earlier this morning, it, it complements very neatly the, the Institute's report. Um, and I want to focus on just one point, which our, our two studies have in common, Margot's Triangle. Um, in our book, uh, in the chapters on Whitehall, we also found that ministers in the coalition government work very effectively and harmoniously together, and lots of officials told us much more harmoniously than under the previous mm -hmm. single party government. Um, but in our chapter on Westminster, um, we also found, uh, like Akash's report, that there's much more distance between the coalition parties um, and quite a lot of 
tension between the party groups, uh, both in the Commons and in the Lords. And my question is, is that triangle, that pyramid, inevitable? Um, or could the parties in Parliament be involved in some way, as is floating in Akash's report, in the midterm review? Could they be involved in a realistic, effective way in the midterm review, or is that moonshine? Right. Gentlemen in front. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Jim Curran. I'm the chairman of the Irish Civil Rights Association. I just want to make a brief point and ask a brief, brief question. Could you just uh, ask the question, because we, we're really running out of time. Yes, well, well, the, quest, well no, the, the point is relevant to the question. Uh, in the occupied part of Ireland at the present time, we have a power-sharing coalition imposed upon us by the, double, uh, by the London government. And the London government has no right to do that because Sinn Féin... Just wait, Mr. Riddle, no, no, allow no, me to make it. Time. No, you're, you're discriminating against me. Are you anti-Irish? Are you racist? You allow a, a Tory MP who has the right to speak in the House of Commons and you're denying me the no, right I, a I, few I, minutes. I'm, I'm not going to ramble on. I'm not going to be very... very I'm just going to be very brief. Please, Mr. Riddle, allow me to make the point. Don't interrupt me. You didn't do that to anybody else and you've been anti-Irish and racist if you, if, you, if, you, if you shut me up. Can you, can, can you, can you allow me to make the point? I'm not, out of, I'm not out of order, Mr. Riddle. Please. 20 seconds. Question, please. Oh. No, but, well, uh, the, 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 yeah, well, the question is, after, uh, in relation to your executive summary, uh, preparing for the next election, you speak about the possibility of a hung parliament. In the event of a hung parliament, if Sinn Féin co co has the balance of power, how would you all like if Angela Merkel told you that, that the United Kingdom is part of Germany? and that she forced you all into a power-sharing coalition, because that is what the uh, London government is imposing upon the Irish nation. And you should be ashamed of yourself, Mr. Riddle, not allowing me to make the brief uh, point in, in relation to the sovereignty of the Irish nation, which was that Sinn Féin won the 1918 general election, and that established the sovereignty of the I Irish nation. And that is why no London government or no... Um, British monarch has the right uh, to impose this policy. That's the point. And you, if, if, you, if, you, if, you hadn't, if you hadn't interrupted me in the first instance, I would have done it. Thank you. Um, that is a very interesting question. Um, <laughs> Ian. <laughs> this might seem less controversial by comparison. Um, oh, come on. Uh, the question primarily to Margo is, as, as, as uh, David uh, brought up, very interesting with Jackie Collins as well. And that is, at what stage do you think both coalition parties have to formally disengage the campaign ahead of the next general election as independent parties. And if you don't do so and are up front of doing so, it's the danger that the coalition will look far more uh, divided as a result. And the second question, which is to the entire panel, is in terms of um, the uh, transparency and trust in the coalition, does the panel believe that it would be helpful if independent advisors could instigate their own investigations? No, I, I think I, I, I'd be very dictatorial on that one. Uh, yeah. uh, one follow one there. From DEFRA. Um, one of the things that governments have traditionally done uh, as a way of uh, re energizing politics, or maybe sometimes as a substitute for policies, is uh, machinery of government changes. And one of the interesting things about this government is not just mm -hmm. no reshuffles, mm -hmm. but no machinery yep. of government changes. And I wonder if there is a particular dynamic of the coalition which makes machinery of government just cre rearranging the deck chairs to create a, a new structure as a substitute for polit clear political thinking makes that rather harder to do. Fine. Why don't we start, Alex, why don't you start on that one? I mean, I, I, I personally, again, I mean, rather like welcoming uh, fewer reshuffles, I think I welcome fewer <laughs> machinery of government changes. It's always... Uh, a distraction. It's always that the costs of uh, actually what you achieve out of a, 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 a machinery of government change are always underestimated. You, there's always pressure to do things incredibly quickly. And uh, so, I, I mean, I'm a, a skeptic about the value of uh, machinery of government changes. And, and I, I'm, you know, as I say, if, if that's one of the side effects of the coalition that we haven't had as many machinery of government changes, then I welcome that. Margot, and there's several points. There's a triangle uh, pyramid one, which Robert Hazel raised, yeah. and disengagement, which I thought was very interesting. Yes, disengagement. Well, come the next election, um, <coughs> both parties will be judged on the government's record. 
and both parties will have been a party to that record. So I don't think disengagement can be that clean. Um, and the public don't like divisions within parties or within governments. And I think both parties should uh, you know, remember that when going out and campaigning. So uh, there's lessons to be learned, I suppose, from the local elections as well, where uh, we've already had two sets of local elections where we've had to campaign nationally as, as well as locally against one another without um, you know, too much uh, acrimony. So I suppose that's, a, that's one bit of guidance. On the, the pyramid point, um, the idea of, uh, well, I, I, I'm, policy review was not sort of um, big on my agenda anyway, but if that were to be something that the government decided upon, I think that there's work being done, probably in both parties, certainly in the Conservative Party, on policy review on an ongoing basis um, at the backbench level. And I don't, I wouldn't hold out much hope for that to be done on a cross-coalition basis. I think um, whilst the coalition's worked effectively at government level, at the backbench level, it is still really quite two distinct tribes, essentially. And whilst there isn't acrimony across the piece, apart from on certain issues, uh, there isn't the machinery there really for a great deal of cross-backbench policy uh, review. So I, I don't foresee much of that going forward. Jack? Um, on, on, on Robert's point, I mean, we had quite a good system in the, in the second four years, in the first four year term, there were real problems um, with uh, um, backbench liaison, not just between the two parties, but also between ministers and, and their own backbenchers uh, and, and the backbenchers of the other, the second party um, in each case. And in, so between 2003 and 2007, we put in place quite a structured system of backbench liaison that saw backbenchers from Labour and the Liberal Democrats talking together quite regularly, but also ministers talking to both on a regular basis. And that was one of the reasons why uh, we never lost a government vote uh, on, a, on, a, on a piece of legislation uh, between 2003 and 2007, despite the fact that we only had a majority of four in the parliament. Um, and I, I think a lot of that was the cohesion that was built around that, that backbench liaison. Um, on the issue of reshuffles, can I just say, to some extent I do sympathise with Alec because um, there were certainly aspects of uh, my good friend TB's reshuffles that used to drive me around a twist. Um, you know, a different minister for energy uh, uh, coming from the part of the UK that had the energy capital of Europe um, used to drive us crazy. A uh, different minister of energy virtually every year. Um, and a different minister for Europe, somebody who's interested in Europe um, virtually every 18 months or so, um, I thought was really unhelpful for our European relations. But I think the ability to re-energise your team is something that's important. And I think, um, uh, and I agree to some extent with the point, although I think you were basically saying it was a good thing that there weren't too many machinery of government changes. Um, I certainly felt uh, in the second term that, 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 that uh, uh, we were ready for machinery of government changes in Scotland. We'd had six, seven, eight years of devolution. There was a need to, sh to, to, to do certain things with the departments and the way that we were operating in Edinburgh in the centre. And it was just impossible to do that, having reached a deal with another party on how many cabinet seats there would be and how, what the split would be between the two parties. So it's more than just getting the decision on the departments and the machinery of government. It's actually, if you've reached an agreement on how many seats there are going to be around the table, if you start to shake up the number of seats that are around the table, then you reopen that, that, that agreement and it becomes really quite challenging. So you have to do that at election time, and it might be that that's one of the areas where the parties do manage to diverge a bit in the, uh, in, in the election time. And the final point I would make is um, that I have nothing but an admiration for the leaders of the coalition in Northern Ireland. I think the formidable political, the political task that they have undertaken over recent years and the success they've made of it means, for me, the most impressive politicians in Britain at the moment are in Northern Ireland and they're making it work. Very, very fair point, as I observed it recently when I was in Belfast. Uh, David. Yeah, I mean, a couple of points. I, I um, agree, really, with, with Sir Alex's points about the, um, uh, the fact that coalitions make both reshuffles and machinery of government changes more difficult, which I largely think is a good idea, too. I suspect also that this Prime Minister is intrinsically more suspicious about reshuffles and machinery of government changes than 
his predecessors and has learned some of the lessons from them. And, and even if he wasn't in coalition, I, I think he would be having fewer reshuffles and be more skeptical about machinery of government changes. I agree with Margot on the disengagement point. I mean, I really don't see a moment when, it's, when there's going to be a sort of ending of the coalition, either before May 2015 or some sudden sort of process in the last six months or nine months where the coalition ceases to function properly as a government. I just think what you'll find in the last year is that there is less new policy making um, and that the coalition leaders are trying to juggle two balls at the same time. One is, you know, coalition unity and demonstrating to the country the coalition is still working and delivering, but also trying to set out their own uh, visions of, of what the country would look like if, um, if, if either of their parties were successful in the next election. And on the, on the midterm review thing, you know, I think in principle, although it can be pretty, a pretty frustrating process for party leaders, it, it's, a good, it's usually a good thing in the long term to involve your parties in things like this because although it's easier in the short term just to dictate to them, you find if you involve them in decisions, including in the formation of coalitions, it gives a long term strength and stability that you've sought their agreement and they've given it and it also makes it much less easy for them to say if only we'd been consulted two years ago we would have told them to do this, that and the other or not to mm -hmm. go into coalition. I think the problem with this potential midterm review is that if it is largely about implementation and finding new ways of delivering existing policies then you don't want to encourage people to put in 84 ideas uh, to spend new amounts of money on um, schemes that would add hundreds of new policies to the existing portfolio. So I think involving the parties in that would be a good thing. It's for each party to decide how to do that. But I think we can't create false expectations that we're going to be delivering marvelous <coughs> new things when not only our budget's very constrained, but we've already got a very full program of stuff to deliver. I think the latter is a very pertinent point because uh, as we look forward, I mean, we're, we're dealing with a period which is going to be an enormous public spending constraint. It affects a lot of the work we're doing here at the Institute. And I think that, that environment, of course, totally complicates it mm -hmm. um, compared, it, um, obviously, with, with the middle of the last decade, which you faced, Jack, it's totally different. Mm. Well, thank you all very much indeed for an absolutely fascinating um, um, uh, hour and a half discussion. Thank you to Akash for, um, I think he's very happy he completed the report on time. Um, and um, for what is a yeah, stimulating yeah. report, it's um, all downloadable, so you, you can read it there. I'm sure we'll carry on with this discussion. Uh, we're not yet at the midpoint of the Parliament, and we, we, we've still got uh, more than two and a half years yeah. to go. So we'll undoubtedly be returning to this institute. We're going to do a lot of work on the run-up to the next election. So I'd, I'd like to thank very much um, uh, Sir Alex Allen for um, not only for today, but also for what his, his previous um, uh, interventions with us here, um, to Margot James, um, for, from her perspective, very much looking at it from the, from the Tory grants roots and someone who wants the coalition to carry on. Um, from Jack McConnell, from uh, his fascinating experience in Scotland um, from, from, from over the six years um, before 2007 election, and also those challenges, which I think are absolutely pertinent on how you look ahead, which I think is crucial to it, and to David Laws, uh, as always. Uh, David is also one of our governors, and I'm very grateful to him here. So um, thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.